Ben, it's been great working with you, especially in the last couple of years, and uh, and I know that you've been tracking a lot of the currents in conservation throughout through your research and writing and your teaching. I wonder if you can give us an overview of where you think we are in in the conservation world these days, uh, and how you're reading the uh, the winds of change. The, the conservation movement is going through a period of upheaval, on my reading. Um, I think it's easy to call it a crisis. I think we use the word crisis um, quite a bit. Um, nevertheless, it seems clear to me in my own work and my own reading of the discussions uh, in the conservation community, the, the intellectual discussions, the practical discussions, that the community is really torn right now, uh, perhaps in two parts, maybe more than that, about the future of, of conservation, the soul of conservation. And on the one hand, we have uh, this idea that conservation should be about finishing the job. It should be about uh, reaffirming the human uh, role on the planet, uh, the human control of Earth systems. Uh, it should be about managing, manipulating uh, systems for their services, for their benefits over the long run, which of course is a great tradition in, in conservation. And on the other side, we see this reaction to that. We see this kind of reaffirmation that conservation should also uh, be about setting places aside from human influence. It should be about um, encouraging a kind of humility uh, uh, concerning wildness and biodiversity and so forth. Um, and that split has probably always been with us uh, in many respects. Sometimes the split is over, oversold, um, but I, I myself think that that, that uh, that we're in a moment right now where the divisions, uh, in a way, are, are deeper than they've ever been. And uh, a lot of this discussion is being carried on under the banner of the new term, Anthropocene, this idea that we as humans now are the dominant force on Earth. Um, it's a new term for what is arguably quite an old idea. Um, but how do you see that this new term and the new thought processes going along with it affecting our relationship with the earth? I'm worried about the currency of the term the Anthropocene in, in conservation and human relations to nature. On the one hand, I, I think that um, it, it captures something that is fairly um, um, obvious, that we have this incredible global impact, uh, that we are indeed a, a geological force on the planet. Um, that's not my concern. The sort of descriptive characteristics of, of the Anthropocene, that, that we're a species with this sort of outsized influence. My concern is what we make of that. And my worry is that that can become a license for further manipulation, further control, um, a kind of um, warrant to continue to pave the planet. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's another discussion that, frankly, um, can, can be exploited uh, and um, can be manipulated for purposes that I think probably are very different than, than the, just the designation of an epoch or a geological mm -hmm. era. Um, so I'm, I guess on my best days, I'm, I'm very skeptical about, about the term. It, it can be useful, I think, for focusing discussions around responsibility to the future, the responsibility for our footprint, the responsibility for the human influence. And so in that sense, if the Anthropocene focuses us uh, around a discussion of what do we want our influence to be, that's fantastic. If the Anthropocene, on the other hand, is um, making the world even safer for additional human influence and additional control of Earth systems, I worry about that. So Ben, you've been exploring a lot of these basic questions about conservation and our motives actually for quite a while. And, and yet now you're intersecting your own arc of thought with this new terminology and this new set of ideas that's being used with that terminology. So how does this idea of the Anthropocene or this age of humans depart or differ from your own concept of environmental ethics and the role of humans in nature? 
So I've been working uh, for quite a while now on a set of issues, uh, historical issues, ethical, philosophical issues concerning the human relationship to nature uh, that I think in many ways um, is very compatible with a lot of the discussion around what the Anthropocene is or, or should be uh, in our thinking and our conservation work. Um, and so I feel in a way that um, it's a term that characterizes a lot of this sort of middle tradition in, in environmentalism that I've been focused on, which is this tradition that sort of runs between uh, the strong wilderness-centric uh, uh, position and the, the more uh, utilitarian or, or um, developed world model. Um, so in that sense, the Anthropocene, I think you could read it as being kind of consistent with this idea that we're here, we're in place, we change the world, the world is changing, um, we know nature through our actions uh, in nature, uh, that we have an influence and we, we must take a responsibility for that influence. My, um, my um, trepidation about the Anthropocene, the way that the construct is being used, is that it is being pushed more toward the one pole, that it's being pushed more toward this, um, almost this valorization yeah. of, of human mastery over nature, that it's, uh, it's okay to be large and in charge on the planet because we, in a way, we always have been. Now we're just understanding scientifically and historically that we're really good at it. And if we're really good at it, we can get even better at it. And it's that kind of logic that I worry about, um, kind of gripping the, the concept. Uh, so on the one hand, we could just say, well, the Anthropocene, there's really nothing new here in terms of understanding that humans have a, a sort of geological role on the planet as a unique species. Um, but if it becomes this um, argument that um, validates additional uh, human control of the planet, that's when I worry that, that it's, it's moving quite far away from, from what I think of being pragmatic environmentalism, pragmatic conservation. And, and let's explore that in, at a couple levels. Yeah. The first level is kind of at the level of species sure. and, and around the theme of extinction. So I know that you've been exploring another kind of new trend and another new term that's arisen in, in conservation, i.e. de-extinction. Um, so can you define de-extinction for us and, and give us a, a brief on your own perspective on this new approach? So de-extinction is it's an, a, a, an application of the tools of synthetic biology to conservation, to revive lost species using a combination or um, a choice of um, genetic engineering, cloning, to recreate, to resurrect species, the passenger pigeon, the Tasmanian tiger, these are the candidate species, the woolly mammoth perhaps, and the most grandiose plants, um, to resurrect these lost species, these lost life forms, and put them back into, in, onto the landscape. Um, the supporters of de-extinction are an interesting group of t technologists, futurists, conservationists. Um, I think the discussion around de-extinction is fascinating. A lot of it focuses on the risk, uh, the ecological risk of restoring lost life forms to, to introducing these populations to, uh, to the landscape. That isn't my biggest concern, actually. My biggest worry is what the extinction does to us. Um, it's very clear to me that it is a kind of expression of this Promethean impulse to create, to control, to, to, to run the universe. Uh, and um, we have a long history in engineering uh, and in environmental design and biotechnology of following that impulse. And it often doesn't work out very well. And not only does it not work out very well, I worry that it's doing something to us as, as humans, as uh, a species, a meaning creating species that often has difficulty in creating its own limits and chastening its appetites for more and more. De-extinction, to me, uh, fuels a fire. It doesn't restore um, a, a value or a, um, a tradition that is worth having. Sometimes we learn more from loss than we do from creation. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the scale, you've also written several interesting pieces and commentaries on the concept of geoengineering. 
right. at the global scale of engineering the planet in response to the threat of climate change. Can you say a few words about how you think of that concept that has recently emerged as well? Geoengineering is a troubling um, topic to discuss. I find it troubling because um, it's very clear that we are committed to a certain degree of climate change now and in the near future. Even if we all woke up tomorrow and there was an international agreement to, um, to, to reverse uh, climate warming, to, to set our emissions levels to 20% below 1990 levels or something like that, the planet is already committed to a certain degree of change because of the lags in the climate system. So geoengineering is troubling because it kind of plays upon that, that um, sense of uh, required response that uh, we ought to do something if we have the tools at our disposal to be able to address uh, concerns to make climate change less bad then you know darn it shouldn't, shouldn't we do it right aren't we morally compelled to do it um, so I find that argument actually fairly uh, persuasive my concern is really twofold about this one problem with that argument is that it actually creates a, uh, a possibility of of deep moral corruption. And in other words, that we can use this sort of expediency argument and we must do something to justify the engineering fix of, of what really is a lifestyle problem. It's the way we live on the planet. Um, and if we know anything about technological fixes, uh, we often f feel that they're easy and we can let the engineers solve it and we can keep living our lives the way we've always lived. Uh, it doesn't really address the root of the problem. And so the moral corruption argument would simply be, mm. it, it takes more than that. Um, the second worry I have, and, and this is a worry I think that I would bring to a lot of these discussions uh, on, on the edges of conservation or environmental management, whether we're talking about de-extinction or uh, genetic engineering more generally, or if we're talking about large-scale manipulation of Earth systems is again this, um, this sense that what we're doing is encouraging our, um, our, our sort of um, sense of control, our sense of mastery, our sense of dominion on the planet, rather than chastening that. Um, if we've learned anything uh, in what the conservation tradition, I think the, the most powerful part of the conservation tradition teaches us is that we do best when we find a way to be humble and we find a kind of uh, forbearance in our relationship to the natural world. This doesn't mean that we have to revert back to the 18th century uh, technologically. It doesn't mean that we have to forego the benefits of modern society. It doesn't mean that we all should um, um, give up on the modern project. What it does mean is that uh, we ought not to take the easy way out that we ought not to convince ourselves that we can engineer ourselves out of the toughest jams, planetary jams that we create. What it does mean is that we need to look very deeply in our culture and our values, our ethical systems, to find sources of response that can allow us to move forward in a more prudent um, and um, solicitous way toward the natural world. So this sort of begs another question that yeah. um, goes back to where we started, and that is, what is the role of the wild in all this? What is the role of what we have called wilderness? Um, and that is now actually a question in a humanized world. Does the wild exist, and how ought we respond to it, and how do we think about it? Does the wild exist in the age of humans? I'm haunted by this question. Um, it's a really difficult one to wrap your brain around. Um, there certainly, for the last two decades or more, has been a, a very vibrant discussion, let's say in environmentalism, in wilderness uh, advocacy, around the utility of the idea of the, of the wild, of, of the wilderness concept. Um, and it's very clear that the idea of wilderness has, has gone through some rough times. It's been deconstructed, it's been reconstructed, it's been 
tossed about. Uh, there have been um, debates that have divided the, the, the conservation community over whether the wild should be at the center of wilderness activism or whether it uh, runs afoul of social justice and uh, uh, culture and gender and so on. So these critiques have been really important and the, the sort of uh, historicizing of the wilderness idea has been really important and it's brought new voices into the discussion which is essential to moving a discussion of the wild forward in the 21st century. It's very clear though that the, the rise, you know, the, the meteoric rise of the Anthropocene idea is putting an additional um, set of pressures on, on the idea of the wild um, because after all if, if we are in the age of humans uh, the wild, the wilderness is um, has been reduced to such a degree that it it's it only exists if we decide it exists, mm. and if we um, we we take a, a course of action to ensure that the little remnants of the wild exist, and and after all, they aren't really wild anyway because we're deciding that they exist and we're managing these pockets of, of wildness. So uh, I can get pretty depressed about that line of argument because I think it leads to a, a pretty dark place. Uh, and um, if the Anthropocene becomes uh, the final nail in the coffin of the, the wild or the wilderness, we've lost something profoundly important. Uh, and that's not the movement I signed up for. Um, if on the other hand, it forces us to reassess and reaffirm our commitment to the wilderness, to endangered species, to experiences in nature that are fleeting uh, and fewer and farther between in, in this um, altered universe we've created, then perhaps it can be a good thing. It can be a moment of clarification to, uh, to help us double down maybe on the things that we care about most deeply. So thinking about the wild in, in the age of humans uh, is an incredibly challenging uh, proposition, but it's never been more important, I think, uh, than it is today. Mm. A question that follows from that is actually ap applying this, especially in the field of restoration, of ecological restoration. And so the, the ideas floating around and being discussed and debated about the age of humans, um, how does this how does this jibe with our ethics about restoration, about restoring damaged landscapes and places? Do you see a clash there or do you see perhaps potential for reconciliation? I think restoration in the Anthropocene or the act of restoration um, is uh, probably um, one of the sunnier aspects of the Anthropocene idea. It's one of the, one of the hopeful um, parts of the story. Um, there's a long debate in environmental ethics about the act of restoration, whether ecological restoration itself is, is sort of in, in a way morally indefensible because we're faking nature, we're, mm -hmm. we're intervening in nature and we're, it's, it's like committing an art forgery or something like that. Uh, I've often thought that's kind of a silly debate because it seems to suggest that there's this capital N nature that exists out there in the world that is independent of culture and that humans can only be interlopers in that in that world. We can only destroy it and screw it up. The Anthropocene construct suggests that that's a that's a, a silly way to think about our, our place on the planet. Uh, so in that sense it actually um, is very supportive of the activity of restoration and it suggests that um, we live in places, we um, have an impact on the landscape, we have an obligation to make, to refashion, to invent systems uh, both for species and other species and for ourselves and that a, an activist sort of humanistic conservation movement that includes these um, acts of restoration, that's, um, that should be at the center of a kind of new conservation ethics. So restoration is a way of engaging, improving on restoring, returning, rehabilitating landscapes uh, to a variety of functions that we could receive benefit from. Um, so in that sense, uh, it, it's, um, it's a very hopeful move. Um, the restoration community, however, is struggling uh, 
with the target of restoration. So if everything is changing, if we're talking about a world of no analog systems where the future is not going to resemble the past, then using reference points for restoration, 1491, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is, um, it, it's a non-starter. So the discussion seems to be shifting a bit in restoration to thinking about, paradoxically, restoring future nature, um, using the tools of restoration to create systems that we want in the future that may have some historical functions to them, but may be very different than historical landscapes. Um, that raises a whole other set of, that's a whole other can of worms to open. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a very complex discussion, um, but it does suggest it, that we have a responsibility to kind of take ownership for those landscapes. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me is fascinating. Well, you, you use the key word there, responsibility. And uh, let's step back from the, from the immediacy of a particular place and restoring it. Restoration is an act of giving back in a sense. We are um, trying to re-engage in landscapes in a way in which we're not simply extracting or exploiting or gaining uh, material. We're, we are trying to re-engage in a different way in which we give something back to a place. But let's scale back or scale up to the whole earth. Um, when you think about our relationship to the earth as a whole, to the, to the planet we live on, what do you what do you think about? What is the earth asking or requiring of us as we go forward? What is the earth asking of us as we go forward? That's a fascinating question. The earth is asking nothing of us, and that's the problem. There's a great silence there following uh, that question in my own mind. Um, it would be much easier if the earth did ask something of us because then we could answer it and we could, perhaps we could figure out whether that answer was satisfactory. What, what, are we doing the right thing? The problem is that there is really no objective way to determine what the right thing is. The earth doesn't want anything with apologies to those who believe in the Gaia hypothesis or, or other uh, kinds of arguments. We're the ones that figure that question out, that answer that question. So in a weird way, and this is where the sort of Anthropocene boosters, I guess, get it quite right, we are in charge in, in, a, in, a, in a basic way, in the sense that we are in charge of our own decisions about how we, we walk on the earth and how we shape it. We aren't completely in charge. Often we think we're more in charge than we are, and we are reminded of our limits, of our planetary limits. The best we can do, and, and this is something that I struggle with in my own thinking, is to take stock of our traditions. And I, I worry that there is, um, there is a mad rush to dismiss history, to dismiss the history of conservation as being um, hidebound, irrelevant, no longer a part of the, of the discussion of what planetary management means in the 21st century. That, you know, Aldo Leopold, that was so long ago, that was a different world. Not at all. The questions are the same. How do we live on a piece of land without spoiling it? How do we take responsibility for the future of a biotically rich environment that we want to pass along to future generations. How do we find a way to limit our own impulses for more and more? Those are the same questions. So the earth is not going to tell us. <laughs> We're going to have to look deeply in ourselves and our own traditions. And, and I would argue that we, um, we dismiss our own history at our peril. Hmm. So we are in charge in quote unquote and yet we're not in charge. There's the paradox. And whereas the idea that we are in charge is on the uh, uptick these days, going back to Leopold, he's the one who said, we are not conquerors. We ought to aim to be, quote, plain members and citizens of the biotic community. 
I hope that, personally, I hope that's not an outmoded idea, certainly, but how do you, again, uh, taking it from the other side, think of that as citizens, not only of our communities and countries, um, what does it mean to be a citizen within a biotic community? Leopold's line about uh, us being citizens in the biotic community is fascinating to me today and witnessing a lot of the hand wringing going on in conservation around human intervention uh, because even if we are skeptical, let's say, about the idea of the Anthropocene, it is undoubtedly true that we are living in the era of ecological intervention, whether that is motivated by the conservation of biodiversity or by the maintenance of ecosystem services, by creating designer ecosystems for some other human purpose. So being a citizen and yet being the shapers of biotic communities, being the managers of biotic communities, being the visionaries behind new communities and novel systems, perhaps some that have never been seen before on Earth, is, if it's not a paradox, it's an incredible tension in the way we think about our role on the planet. Um, the great challenge, as I see it, is squaring our moral compulsion to be citizens, a kind of um, humble, almost egalitarian understanding of people and nature, while also understanding that we're citizens but we're somehow privileged in, in, in the natural world. We're privileged in our ability to deliberate, we're privileged in our ability to, to, to chart a course, we're privileged in our opportunity to fix mistakes, and we have, with all that privilege and with that power, this responsibility to make, to make smart choices. And so citizens, yes, the moral vision of being a citizen and not a conqueror of the land community in, in Leopoldian language, I think is incredibly profound and incredibly important. And, and we need that more than ever. The challenge is reconciling that chastened view of our, of our own activity and our own will and our own power with frankly our, you know, the, the sheer fact of our, of our influence on the planet and our ability to change things. That's the challenge. And as we all seek to think well and act well in meeting that challenge, Ben, there's kind of a question that has been in my own discussions and conversations over the last few years really taken hold for me, and that is the question of hope human response to difficulty or to anticipation of hope, which seems like a very simple term and a simple concept. We all use the term, but it's pretty complex once you get into the conversation. So amid all of these complexities and changes in conservation and in the world at large, what's your own concept of hope these days? How does it factor into your work? We have to have hope in conservation. If we don't, it's game over. Uh, why would we do it? Why, against all odds, would we make these sacrifices? And I do believe they're often sacrifices. I think there's a, there is a, there's a narrative in the conservation community now that suggests that um, the, the notion of sacrifice, the notion of struggle, the notion of limits, uh, that those have, those have held conservation and environmentalism back. Uh, fair enough. I mean, we can look at the 60s and 70s and some of the rhetoric and see the doom and gloom and, and the absence of hope and a message around uh, you know, the world is going to end and the population bomb and, and, and we needed an authoritarian regime to, to, to save us from ourselves. That was you know, of a piece of a time. Um, my worry with the, um, the sort of exuberant hopefulness <laughs> that we find in some of the new conservation rhetoric is that it masks what I take to be a, 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 a kind of troubling idea, which is we can be hopeful because the world is of our making and we're the ones that get to decide what we want this world to be. And because we get to decide what we want the world to be, um, it is a great 
challenge to human ingenuity, ambition, and power. Um, so when hope gets perverted to basically being an apology for whatever we want, mm -hmm. then it becomes a destructive force in my mind in mm -hmm. conservation. When hope is channeling the best of us and what we want in the world with a sense of the world pushing back in some way, of there being limits, of there being a kind of um, standard, a baseline, a, a, a line that maybe we draw ourselves, but we respect it because we don't want to push past it. That to me is, is what real hope is. There's another uh, perspective on this theme that I've been also having conversations about. And there's others who reject the concept and say, we, we ought to be realistic. We're in a heap of trouble. And to be hopeful and to create false hopes that we can solve this is actually not helpful. And that, in fact, we ought to be acting not because we hope for a good consequence, but we ought to be acting because it's the right thing to do, regardless of the consequence. How do you, how do you take that question or that point? The question about the, um, you know, how do we balance this, um, this notion of, of, of moral responsibility with also wanting to feel good or to, to, to kind of convince ourselves that, that, um, that feeling hopeful is the right way and that we ought not worry about uh, you know, mass extinctions or global climate change or any of these other um, trends that are, are so troubling. Um, that is a really difficult um, psychological challenge, I think, to people. I think there's a, um, a community of thought which would say people don't do well when they're scared. They don't want to be scared into action. They don't want to be um, reminded of our exceeding the background rate of extinction by thousands, perhaps tens of thousands. Uh, of times. Uh, they don't want to be reminded of parts per million in the atmosphere. Um, they don't want to be reminded that, that we live in a world of risk. Uh, and so they need hopeful messages and hopeful ideas to, to hang on to, to, to weather the storm. Um, the concern though is the whistling by the graveyard uh, concern that, that well, um, there really is something there to, to be concerned about. There's something there to be worried about. And being clear-eyed about those challenges is a part of being a responsible conservationist. You can't just make them go away because you hope the world is a better place. And sometimes being honest about the challenges, as bleak as they may be, um, is essential to moving, I mean we've known this historically, it's essential to moving people forward, it's essential to building coalitions around certain challenges. and, and uh, and so hope is, um, is a great, um, it's a great organizing um, belief system, I guess. If you think the world can be a better place, it can motivate activism and action. Uh, if it becomes a kind of analgesic <laughs> that, that um, uh, dulls the pain, uh, you know, perhaps that also can be useful in certain circumstances. If it becomes more than that, and it starts to paper over some of these, some of these real uh, reports of, of uh, environmental conditions, then we have a problem. And, and then we're just, we are, we're whistling by the graveyard. We're making ourselves feel better because it's just too depressing. Hmm. Well, we started off uh, asking the big question of, of where we are in conservation and your take on it. So I, I think we'll circle around back after this discussion. Um, so, again, taking stock of all this swirling of ideas and science and concepts and emerging opportunities and risks, are there any last words you'd want to offer on, on where we are in conservation and what ought to guide us as we go forward? The course of conservation uh, and, and the future of conservation um, is um, I would argue has never been more important. Maybe we always say that when we have these moments of introspection, when we feel that there's change in the community. Uh, and that change can become imposed from without. It can be you know, external forces. It can be the world itself is changing, or it can be within. The community is, 
taking stock of its priorities uh, and its traditions. Uh, this has always been, I think, a, a really um, fascinating exercise or moment when it happens because I think we're in this, um, you know, the, there's a sense of this, this watershed moment happening in conservation right now where people are maybe taking sides, maybe trying to figure out um, just what this tradition means in the 21st century, um, what the role of humans is in this movement, whether this is a human-centered movement, whether there still is a role for those who care about the wild for its own sake, for the traditional preservationist mission that has always fueled conservation has really been its moral center, I would argue. Um, and I'm certainly among those who's trying to figure this all out. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge and it's a great, uh, great opportunity as well, I think, to clarify our values and our, and our vision um, moving forward. Um, my biggest concern about conservation is that we're, I, I worry that we're witnessing the crowding out of, maybe even the snuffing out of the values of, of nature preservation that to me were really essential to what cons good conservation work is. Now I, I recognize that it's not just that. And when I say preservation, I probably have a more pragmatic view of preservation than let's say someone like Dave Foreman, for example. Um, but the tradition of protecting nature for its own sake, of, of caring, having a kind of solicitude for wild species, of, um, of being very careful about our incursions uh, into the more remote parts of, of the world, of encouraging the kind of virtues of restraint and humility that we think of as being part of a kind of wilderness ethic, that to me, if, if we lose that in conservation, I'm really worried that we're going to lose it, to tell you the truth. If we lose that in conservation, we've lost something incredibly important. And I worry that once we lose something like that, we will never get it back. Um, that is not to say that we shouldn't focus on the resilience of ecosystems, the maintenance of ecosystem services, issues of sustainable development and uh, sustainable urban ecosystems and all these other concerns that have risen to the fore in conservation and environmentalism in the, over the last few decades, uh, profoundly important for, for us, for future generations, uh, and also important to think of landscapes outside of the traditional wild. Um, so I, I don't want to dismiss any of that. My worry is that we are, the pendulum has shifted so far to that side that those who still want to carve out a space for this other, uh, more preservationist style of conservation, uh, are seen as reactionary, are seen as behind the times, are fighting losing battles. And I worry that if, if this continues, we are going to be sacrificing values in, in conservation that we will never be able to get back. Mm -hmm. A lot of this has to do with context. A lot of it is how do we understand the yeah. human world within the larger reality, whether we call it the wild or the cosmos, whatever terms we, we wish to choo choose. But the idea that the human now dominates not just the earth, but the cosmos. And yet we're embedded within larger and larger systems. And so how do we can we, can we agree with the, these newer appreciations of the human role while still keeping a sense of our embeddedness within a larger, perhaps wild system? So how do we reconcile these um, competing impulses perhaps to, to, to concede maybe that we have um, a remarkable planetary, perhaps even cosmological influence uh, in the universe uh, and on the one hand, and, and at the same time, uh, the notion of, of the very, I think, um, important notion of being embedded in, in ecosystems and embedded in communities. Um, that's a tough nut to crack. I mean, that's what it's all about. I think that's the challenge that haunts um, this shift in conservation and the acceptance of the Anthropocene and the acceptance of the human uh, influence on the planet. Um, for me, I find solace in history. Uh, I, I, I think we are all searching for an anchor for this discussion. I find that anchor in the tradition, in the conservation tradition. I find it in the work of, yes, Leopold, of course, but I also find it in the work of others, Lewis Mumford, 
um, Liberty Hyde Bailey, Benton Mackay, Rachel Carson. Uh, what I find very vibrant in that tradition is that they remind us that we are embedded in systems, we learn about systems as we, are, uh, when, as we continue to change them and they change us, uh, but one of the things we often in, in do and should learn in those systems is a sense of forbearance, a sense of limits, a sense of humility about our actions. Um, that to me, that strain, that, that temperament, that ecological temperament we find in that tradition, that is incredibly important for uh, guiding our, our thinking and our decision making today. Um, that, to, that gives me some comfort that we will find our way out of this mess uh, because we have this, um, this brilliant tradition of environmental thinkers and writers who have enlarged our consciousness about being honest about our human influence on the planet and also stopping and saying, you know what, enough is enough. You know, sometimes we need to pull back. Mm. And we need to pull back, not just for the sake of nature, but for our own sake. And that to me is, if that's, a, that's a, just an incredibly important message in the tradition. Well, and those names that you mentioned, and I would yeah. say yourself, all of them are thinkers, actors, and doers who, who have striven to reconcile these tensions in conservation. And so we're, we're in this period when polarization, again, seems to be uh, yeah. where things are headed. And yet you have done so much work in trying to, again, remind us that we have a tradition of reconciliation. And that tradition is not only still relevant, it's, it's more relevant than ever. Any last words you'd like to offer on, on that theme of reconciliation in, in these competing needs and values in conservation? Reconciling these, I don't want to call them warring impulses, they're, they're competing impulses in conservation remains, I think, an enduring challenge. Uh, I would, I'm not naive enough to think that we will, we will actually once and for all reconcile the use versus preservation, uh, uh, beauty, utility, uh, poles in conservation. I mean, we've, we've been debating that for a long time. I think we're going to continue to debate that. In many respects, what we're going through now, and we have some new language, it's dressed up, we call it the Anthropocene. Uh, but the debates that it spawned are really quite old. The, they're, they're the eternal debates of conservation. And um, one could take great, um, could despair in that and oh no we're we've we're back to the old um, struggles we're back to the old um, uh, challenges and, and we never get past them I actually take a little bit of hope from that in that we're trying to work it out we're trying to reconcile these these two um, these these two divisions uh, we have a history of people thinkers in the tradition who have shown us how to do it um, who have given us models of what it means to, you know, use nature with great care, to exercise the human will on the planet with a sense of restraint and humility, to understand that even if the world is changing, there are certain values that we hold dear that we might not want to change. Um, and that's okay, and, and they lived with that. Uh, and so, I think we could learn a lot by returning to the tradition. I don't think that the tradition is, um, is outmoded. I, I think that this, um, I, I call it the sort of the, the, the middle way or the third way, the running between the sort of conservation preservation split. Uh, and to me, that's, that's where all, all the action is in the movement. And I think that that third way of reconciling beauty and utility and conservation and preservation human-centered, nature-centered, um, that's a, a very um, powerful strand in the movement. The, the overgrowth of the poles obscures it, mm. and, and the, the force of the personalities obscures it. Uh, we are replaying that right now, I think. Um, and if we could all just take a step back, take a deep breath, and realize this is not the first time we've had these discussions. Uh, and in fact, there is great wisdom in, in looking at history and how these issues have been explored. I think we would learn a lot and we would, we would inform the discussion, whether it's about the Anthropocene, uh, 
or the wilderness in, in an age of climate change or about rapid biodiversity loss on an urban planet, right, we would find this, uh, the kind of anchoring that, that can help us uh, make more intelligent, more um, uh, informed decisions. Well, thanks, Ben. I, I, the word humility has shown up more than a few times in this discussion, and I really appreciate the humility you bring to, to really what are some of the most complex questions and debates that we are engaged in right now. So thanks for joining and sharing your thoughts here. Thank you. Pleasure.